Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. <clears throat> uh, today's webinar is on the practical considerations for ultrasound probe disinfection. My name is John Burdak and I lead the uh, Clinical Affairs Group at Nanosonics and will be moderating this evening's session. We're delighted to work with Philips to bring you information about the latest research in infection control in ultrasound. Tonight we are very fortunate to have with us two experts in their field, uh, Robert De Jong, a leading sonography educator and one of the world's leading HPV researchers, distinguished Professor Craig Myers. Before I introduce our first speaker, there are just a few housekeeping issues. To... And now to tonight's program. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Robert De Jong, who has been involved in ultrasound since 1976. Robert has spent the last 25 years at a leading US hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, where he's currently the radiology technology manager in ultrasound. He was honored by the Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonographers with the Joan Baker Pioneer Award in 1996 and evaluated to fellow membership status by both the SDMS and AIUM. Robert is registered by the ARDMS in abdominal OBGYN vascular and adult echocardiography. Robert lectures at various local, state and national levels on a variety of topics including new technologies and advances, Doppler, abdominal, teamwork, customer service and his newest passion, infection control. So without further ado, I'll now hand over to Robert De Jong to begin the presentation. Thank you, John, and welcome to our webinar. I'm going to kick things off with the importance of infection control in ultrasound. And we'll cover such things as why disinfect ultrasound probes, some guidelines to help you, and some practical considerations when you're setting up your reprocessing protocol. Our learning objectives, we're going to describe the diverse applications of sonography and the associated risk of infection, determine the proper procedures for ultrasound probe disinfection, and establish procedures that will ensure patient safety and, importantly, meet accreditation requirements. But why is this all important? Well, hospital-acquired infections are a huge drain to our medical costs in the medical system. And patients can get infected through ultrasound, as we'll see later on. So you may be thinking, where can they get infected in ultrasound? Well, here we have a list of various places our hands, the transducer, which I consider an extension of our hand, the scanning table or stretcher, the ultrasound unit, because the patient may use that to assist them getting on and off the stretcher, or sometimes they just reach up and touch it, the door handles, especially in outpatient settings, and in the dressing rooms. So there are a variety of ways our patients can spread infection to one another and to us. If we take a look here on, on some of the ultrasound equipment, 21% of ultrasound transducers for intracavitary probes are still contaminated after using low-level disinfection wipes, 21%. If you look at these intracavitary probes, so that would be transvaginal as well as endorectal, about 13% of these transducers have bacteria on them and about 1% are contaminated with a virus. So post-infection, post-disinfection with wipes and sprays just aren't doing the job 100% of the time. Same thing with our Doppler transducers. And these may be things that we use in our lab, uh, vascular labs using the, kind of the pencil probes or our physicians doing uh, pedal pulses. So these probes can be contaminated with disease-causing pathogens also. And the ED, again, lots of action down there, trauma patients. 57% of those probes still had blood on them, as well as 46 probes were contaminated with bacteria. In a survey that was done through five different emergency departments and five different intensive care units. So again, it's very easy for our transducers to become infected, but more, more importantly, it's they can stay infected and pass those germs on and those viruses from patient to patient to patient, as well as from patient to you. So this is why we want to disinfect our ultrasound transducers. Here's two examples to show how critical this is. So there was a patient who actually died from hepatitis B reported in the United Kingdom in 2012. 
And this was caused because the transducer was incorrectly reprocessed. So this triggered a review of guidelines and training and requested a UK-wide review of transducer reprocessing practices. Here, two patients got hepatitis C, one from an intercavitary transducer and one from a prostate biopsy transducer. As you can see, the one with the intercavitary transducer was in a sensitive conception. So again, these are not the kind of patients we want to be giving hepatitis C to. Well, actually, we don't want to give hepatitis C to any patient. So again, by not doing things properly, we are putting our patients at risk. There are many organizations that can help us with guidelines and standards. The Center for Disease Control, the Food and Drug Administration, the Joint Commission, and the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. So these different organizations can help us learn what we need to do and why we need to have a good ultrasound reprocessing. So there are a lot of misconceptions out there about how transducers or our ultrasound probes should be disinfected. And we sort of divide our transducers into two groupings. One is the surface probe, so things that the transducers that we use for general scanning, abdominal, pelvic, vascular, cardiac, and then the intracavitary probes, again, that will be used for vaginal or rectal or in cardiac transesophageal echo. So typically with the surface probes, we typically wipe them off with either a paper towel, get the gel off of them, um, and if there's no body fluids, that may be all that we do. Or we can disaffect them with one of these ultrasound wipes that are currently available. The intracavitary probes are mandated to have high-level disinfection. So we have to choose the correct disinfection method depending upon what we're going to use the transducer for. So here you can see at the bottom we have critical, semi-critical, and non-critical, and we'll discuss them shortly. But let's take a look. So again, our probes may contact sterile tissue or blood. We're doing ultrasound and surgery. We do some intraoperative procedures. We do a lot of drainages and biopsies of various organs, livers, thyroids, and these can be bloody different kinds of needle guidance, transvaginal ooze site retrievals, placing catheters and lines in various veins and arteries in the body, and may assist in vascular ablation. So a lot of time these transducers have to be sterile or high level disinfection and use a sterile sheath. Because this, again, if we're in surgery or intraop or doing something that will contact the tissue they need to be sterile so that we don't contaminate those tissue. Probes that may contact mucous membranes and non-intact skin, such as our transvaginal and transrectal scans, our transesophageal scans, surface ultrasound where there's broken skin, so somebody post-op and may have an open wound, wound scanning, or burn graft evaluation. So these all require semi-critical disinfection, which is a high-level disinfection and used with a sheet. So the difference here is with the critical, again, that has to be sterilized, and the sheet also has to be sterile. Here with the mucous membranes and non-intact skin, the sheet does not have to be sterile, but obviously it will be clean. And we can scan, again, our normal scanning where the skin is healthy and intact. So, again, our transabdominal scans, our abdominal scans, thyroid scans, our vascular scans, anything that's touching the skin. And these are non-critical and require low-level disinfection, which, again, for a lot of people is using the various wipes or chemicals that are out there to clean off the probe and do some sort of disinfection between our patients. So where do these come from? So our disinfection levels are based on what's called the Spalding criteria. So again, the critical level, that intraoperative kind of scanning, the transducer must have pure sterilization. All viable microorganisms must be destroyed. Obviously, we don't want to take a transducer with contamination on it and put it directly on a liver uh, in an intraoperative situation and cause abscesses or worse. 
are high level disinfection. Again, these are typically the intercavitary transducers. All viable microorganisms must be destroyed except certain bacterial spores. And then our non critical level, again, our surface transducers. Most vegetative bacteria and viruses destroyed except the bacterial spores, mycobacteria, fungi, or small nine lipid viruses. So these are the different levels that we have to disinfect our transducers. Again, the most complex being the critical, where that's going to be sent outside the ultrasound department to be sterilized and usually is returned to us in a sterile package uh, that we would open in a sterile fashion in a sterile room. Typically, what we're going to be dealing with in normal day-to-day -day ultrasound are the semi-critical and the non-critical types of disinfection. Again, most people will use semi-critical for their endocavitary scanning and non-critical on the rest of their transducers. But there's some problems with this that we're going to point out and discuss. Our service transducers can actually be more contaminated than our intracavitary probes. Here we have the results of a study that shows a surface probe as well as the intracavitary probe head. So on the left we have the surface probe, and again, you can see the little circles are the different viruses and bacteria, the different infections that are on the transducer, and the sham, again, is sort of our baseline that we compare it to. And you can see that there's actually a lot more than over here on the right on our intracavitary probe head both with proper high-level disinfection, again, takes the probe down to the sham level. So here you can see an article, Efforts to Attenuate the Spread of Infection, a Prospective Observational Multicenter Survey of Ultrasound Equipment in Australian Emergency Departments and Intensive Care Units. And again, you can see the high percentage of transducers that were still affected. What about probe sheets? Again, we do cover our transducers with probe sheaths, and we want to continue doing that. And you can sort of see here over the years, in 1995, 25 to 81% there was some probe sheath breakage or leakage. Over the years, up to 2000, as you can see here, condoms used with endovaginal transducers had a 0.9 to 5% breakage, and at 2007, again, the Condoms used with transrectal probes had a little higher breakage rate of 9%. So even using sheaths, there's always the risk of contaminating that transducer directly with body fluid. So the Center for Disease Control does mandate that high-level disinfection be used on these transducers regardless of probe cover use. Now, this does not mean we do not use probe covers. By all means, we still continue to use the probe covers. But the point of this slide is to show you that even using probe covers is not enough and that we need to take extra precaution with these transducers that do touch the mucous membranes and give them that extra level of disinfection that we typically don't do with our surface probe. So we still use our covers and then we still perform high level disinfection. Again, the reason being because there is some percentage of um, breakage there. Again, 9% is a lot better than 100% if we didn't use it. So infection control is important everywhere ultrasound is used. And I think 2016 and 2017, maybe starting in 2015, has sort of been the year of infection control in ultrasound. And if you, especially if you work in a hospital like I do, infection control has seemed to focus on ultrasound. I think we've been sort of out of sight, out of mind, but recently people are realizing the importance of doing proper disinfection with ultrasound transducers. So we have come to the forefront. And people are really looking because, again, we want to keep our patients safe. So as you can see from this slide, you know, ultrasound is just used these days all over the place. It's no longer radiology, fetal assessment, vascular lab, and cardiology. Uh, we're in the emergency department. We're in orthopedics. We are in the intensive care units. We are in offices, breast centers. So we are now all over the place. So it's not just the major parts or the major centers where ultrasound is used, but it's every place where ultrasound is used must, again, 
take care of those transducers and disinfect them properly to prevent spread of infection between our patients. So how do we put these ideas into practice? All right. Well, first of all, we have to do is we have to look at our transducer, the manufacturer of our equipment, and look at what can we use to clean and disinfect our transducers. Because not every product can be used on every transducer. And sometimes not every product can be used on every transducer for the same brand and type of equipment. So some transducers, you may be able to use one method, but for certain other transducers, you might have to use another. So the first thing you want to do is go to your manufacturer's website, pick the model of your machine, and they have great um, PDF files. They have great charts that show every transducer they make and all the various ways that you can disinfect, low-level disinfection, high-level disinfection, and some may even have critical levels of disinfection and the products that are approved for that transducer. So I'm a firm believer, again, in using high-level disinfection. And a unit like the Trophon is just very easy to use. They can be in the rooms. I love it because the patients see you taking the transducer out of the device. Some of them will ask, well, what is that? And I can say, well, to ensure your safety, we use high-level disinfection to make sure that this probe is clean before I use it on you. And they love it. So as you're putting together your reprocessing protocol, you have to look at where is my high-level disinfection going to be? Is it going to be in a central location, or is it going to be inside the room? Because that then adds whole levels to your protocol as you decide, how do I get the transducer from the room to the area of reprocessing? Because you just can't take the transducer off the machine, wipe the gel off of it, and walk down the hall. You have to look at what the infection control policy of your hospital is, because you're going to treat this like a biological hazard as you're walking down the hall. So it's got to be in a proper transportation container that's clearly marked biohazard and take it to the place. You may have to use personal protection gear as you're walking through the hall. Um, so, again, that takes time and an expense. Or if you have it inside the room, again, you just wipe the gel off as per manufacturer's recommendations, get it pre-cleaned, put it in the Trophon, and do your thing and come back seven minutes later and it's, and it's ready for you. So as you're looking at your reprocessing protocol, again, things that we have to look at is the cleaning part, the disinfection part, and now even the storage part. I tell you, I've been in ultrasound 40 years. I've been in my current job 26 years, lived through seven or eight joint commissions, and up until last year, they probably spent maybe 10 minutes tops in ultrasound. We don't hurt people. What do we do? We don't use any kind of contrast that hurts people. Uh, we don't have to worry about warmers and this and that. So they pretty much come through, maybe asked a few questions and on their way. Last year, they spent almost two hours at two different times going over our reprocessing protocols, our procedures, looking at log sheets. So this is huge with Joint Commission. We really need to take this seriously and look at our protocols and make sure that they will meet the Joint Commission standards or whatever accrediting body your department or hospital or clinic may be using. So let's take a look. So things to consider, the safety and efficacy, is there any toxicity to it? Which might mean how do I store it? How do I dispose of it? Uh, what kind of personal protection gear am I going to need? Is it suitable for point of care use? Again, we already talked about probe compatibility. Again, looking at what the spalding criteria requires. And then again, depending upon what you're using, you may have to test for concentration, the temperature of the solution, the pH, and then what is the time for, of the process? Workflow considerations, is it a manual process or an automatic process? Again, how long is it going to take? Sink requirements, because you can't use the same sink to pre-clean the transducer, take it out of the solution, and then rinse it off in the same sink. So you need a dirty sink and a clean sink. That can be side by side, but again, those are the kinds of considerations you need to look at 
as you consider how you're going to disinfect the transducers. Traceability. And, again, lots of things now on storing because, again, some of the infection control, some of the Joint Commission guidelines are we just can't have these transducers hanging out on these wall racks like we used to be. They have to be sort of out of the air and uh, some sort of storage to keep them protected. And, of course, these days it's all about the money. So what are the costs? How long will it take to do this reprocessing? You know, if it's a process that keeps the sonographer from scanning for 10, 20 minutes, how effective is that? What are the staffing requirements, training involved? If there's waste disposal, how does that happen? Is it easy to comply? What are the capital costs? What are the consumable costs? Because everything is going to be used, have an expiration date, and will have to be replaced. So these are all the kinds of things that are taken into consideration when you're putting together your reprocessing and protocols. And some of these liquid things that we have, um, again, only disinfect the part of the transducer that goes in the patient. But there is a handle there. And, again, these bacteria and viruses can crawl up the shaft to get to the handle or be on your hands to get to on the handle. Um, and, again, studies have shown that more than 80% of these handles are contaminated. So when you're looking at the process, you have to say to yourself, well, how can I get that handle disinfected? And you know, to me, that's one of the beauties of the Trofine system is that the handle is included in the disinfection process. Again, traceability. Again, this is, again, really important. We have to be able to document that we've done the process, we've done it correctly, that it passed the process, and if need be, how can we find which transducer was used on which patient? And again, there's various ways to do this. So again, you need to find the best way uh, for you in your lab. And again, the companies usually have things to help assist us, like little label printers to, that we can use for labels and, and put in our documentation. So we need to be able to trace the disinfection, the use of the medical device on the patient for follow-up in case there is an outbreak or that we can document a disinfection failure. So we have to record which probe was used on a particular patient. Uh, so, for example, we've come up with a numbering system. So all, all our transducers have a little label on them, you know, one, two, three, four, nothing fancy. Um, so when we go to our log sheet, I say I'm, I'm disinfecting transducer number three, uh, the time, so again, it's 3.30 p.m., did the system pass, what time it was removed, those kinds of things are, need to be documented. So the when, the how, the by, uh, so again, we have to put our initials by the process, and unfortunately, that's not good enough for uh, the Joint Commission. So in the back of our book are the initials and the person's full name so that, that it can be traced as needed. And then again, probe storage. Again, like I said, we can no longer just have them hanging on the walls. In fact, in our place, they only want the transducers that we will be using for that patient on the unit. They don't want us keeping uh, multiple transducers on the unit just to be there to have them there, that the transducer on the unit must be a transducer that we're going to use on that particular patient. Now, whether or not we use it is another story, but, again, we want to have the, the correct tools there for when we do our patient, not, not have to go searching for them. But those transducers that we're not using have to be stored in a method that protects them from being infected. And, again, this is something you might work with with your infection control department uh, to discover different solutions. Staff training and compliance, again, this is a big issue. Again, the Joint Commission, how do I know my staff is trained? How can you prove to me your staff have been trained? So all staff should undergo some sort of training in the cleaning and disinfection process, including traceability, and they should be assessed and recorded as part of initial training. Um, and again, in our place, staff should be given refreshers at regular intervals. We do every two years, and that assessment documented. So. A lot of information there. Again, this is just really huge in the ultrasound community. Uh, there's multiple papers out there showing, and why did this all start? Because they're showing how our transducers 
can have this bacteria, uh, these infections, these viruses on them that we are passing on from patient to patient. And again, hospital-acquired infections is a huge problem, billions of dollars of a problem, uh, just in the United States. And again, this is a worldwide issue. So again, and patients die from hospital-acquired infections. So this is nothing to take lightly. Uh, or they can get sick, more sick than when they came in, and be more debilitated when they leave. So, you know, there's a lot of looking at these kinds of things. So it's not just obviously ultrasound, but, you know, different areas inside the hospital, because our goal has got to be reduce hospital-acquired infections. So, again, as sonographers, we've got to take this seriously. We can be part of the problem, and we really need to see how can we make sure that the patient does unfortunately acquire an infection while in the hospital, that it wasn't because of ultrasound. It wasn't because of our poor reprocessing techniques or our attitude of, well, it's not going to happen here. So we've got to really take this seriously. We need to work with our infection preventionists, our infection control people. Again, I know all about ultrasound. They know all about infection control. We put our two great minds together and come up with incredible solutions for our patients. And, you know, I'm the first to admit, five years ago, I hated my infection control people. They were a pain. They were always coming down, telling me how to do things and causing my sonographers more work. And I was like, well, we don't have enough time to do this. You know, go away. We've never infected people. But as I learned more and more about this, I realized, how do I know I've never infected a patient? So, again, I sort of had a change of heart. I could sort of say the scales fell off my eyes, and I realized that this is something to take seriously. So now they're my best friends, and I love working with them. Because, again, the point is together we can keep our patients, our families, and ourselves safe. Thank you. And don't forget to send in your questions. I will have time for questions at the end of the talk. Thank you, Bob.